Good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, and I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Hopefully we have uh, participants all over the world joining us today. Really delighted to be here today as your host. Um, now, corporate safety precautions don't allow open flame on a Zoom meeting, so you'll have to use your imagination on that. Uh, but we do have a wonderful discussion today. I'm Jay Erdley, Global Head of the Financial Services Practice for Pontoon, and today we're discussing direct sourcing. Now, direct sourcing is a strategy whereby a company leverages its employer brand to source and curate talent. Uh, creating private talent communities, specifically, or most often, for a contingent workforce program. It is one of the biggest trends in our industry. Um, uh, it's, it's been a keynote topic at, at many of the major conferences, and also evidenced recently by a survey from staffing industry analysts, which saw 60% of their respondents say that they would be exploring direct sourcing by 2023. And so with that in mind, with that level of interest in mind, our discussion today is aimed at industry leaders who want to know more about direct sourcing, are curious about direct sourcing, are already uh, uh, considering a direct sourcing strategy, but could benefit from lessons learned and best practices from industry experts who've already begun a direct sourcing journey. Now, with that, I'd like to ask our panel to introduce themselves, since I'm certain no one has joined this webinar to see me talk. Scott Farley. Uh, since uh, you probably expected this, uh, but why don't you lead us off? Sure. Um, Scott Farley, Global Lead for Labor at the Northern Trust Company in Chicago. I've uh, been there for about eight years and, uh, you know, from a high level, we have about $500 million to spend going through our overall program, both SOW and staff augmentation, and happy to be here and, and talk a little bit about our journey through direct sourcing from the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uh, happy to talk with Jason and uh, the rest of you guys uh, about uh, what we did. Great. Thank you, Scott. Jason, I'll ask you to pick up the baton next. Thank you. Um, I'm Jason Carter. I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition for EMEA for Astellas. I think on the invite, it looked a lot more grandiose than that, but that's essentially what I do. Um, Astellas is a pharmaceutical company and we specialize in oncology, nephrology, uh, transplant, urology. Um, in my seven years at Astellas, I've been uh, responsible for implementing MSP and RPO. Uh, and now I'm a account managing uh, our MSP and RPO. And as, as uh, in the most recent months, uh, direct sourcing as part of our managed service program has become uh, a, a sort of key topic and uh, I'm, I'm sure many of the people on the call I've got many questions and uh, you know I could sure do with uh, benefiting from uh, Scott's hindsight so yeah, glad to be on the call and with you all. Great thank you Jason and Justin why don't you round us out today. Hi everyone Justin Lumby I'm Chief Operating Officer and Partner with Talnet. Uh, for those who don't know us Talnet is an enterprise software platform uh, that uh, integrates the VMS and provides the technology layer um, in the facilitation of direct sourcing. Happy to be here and uh, participate in the chat this morning. Great. All right, gents. So let's get comfortable around the proverbial fireplace. And Scott, I'm going to ask you to get us started. You have already executed on a direct sourcing strategy. So, you know, just get the ball rolling. Give us a high level understanding of your direct sourcing structure and what successes and benefits you've realized from that? Sure, nice easy question to start. I appreciate that today. So, um, you know, we, we really focused our efforts more in the US. 80% uh, of our requisitions were in the US. So that's kind of where we started out our journey with direct sourcing. Uh, today, we've only rolled it out uh, in the US, uh, just more, due to the fact that the, the overall need hasn't really been there in some of the other countries that we support. We rolled this out in July of 2019. So we've been doing it for almost uh, three years at this point. Uh, some of the main drivers for implementing were to really find that alternate channel of, of procuring talent. Uh, obviously being in procurement, uh, it, you know, looking for cost savings was also one of the main drivers. 
And then another one was improved attrition rates. As we've managed our program, we've seen that attrition rates have gone up year over year, uh, probably for the last seven or eight years. So what, one of the main drivers was trying to see if we can improve that overall attrition rate. Um, we have checked the box for all of those benefits so far as we've rolled out our program over the last three years. Uh, although at differing rates of speed, I would say that they all haven't been right off the bat. We, we checked the, bar, uh, the box on all of them, but uh, we have seen significant savings uh, through our program. Attrition levels have been improved and we are bringing in a diverse and different uh, level of talent coming in through our direct sourcing channel. From a structure perspective, it, you know, we'll stay at a high level. We have a curator who manages the talent pool for us. Uh, they're also doing the payroll for the, for the resources that are going through the talent pool. We have an MSP and had the same MSP prior to this rollout that manages the requisition process. And then we integrated TalentNet um, with our, our VMS, uh, and that actually has been a really seamless process. So we're happy to say that uh, you know implementation went well uh, three years ago. We were able to manage our program, uh, and then we, I'm sure there's going to be other questions that we could get into around uh, the day-to-day -day and uh, some of the great things that have happened and some of the pitfalls that we've also seen. Brilliant. Thanks, Scott. Um, I mean, one of the conversations that we've been having with our, uh, our managed service provider is um, how moving to a direct sourcing model can uh, support quicker access to talent and really, you know, build that agility into, into the recruitment process. I was just wondering if that's something you've seen and you could talk a bit more to that. Sure. Direct sourcing has provided us options, right? At the end of the day, we started this because we wanted a different option other than just going to our general staffing firms. It has given us access to a talent pool that we can control a little bit more than our standard program of staffing firms. If you think about it, these are people that are reaching out to Northern Trust. They're going to our career site, they're clicking on a link, that's, uh, and then they're looking at the roles that we have open. So they're already searching out our organization, our brand, and right there, they already have a, a vested interest or a different interest level than those resources that are maybe getting called by the staffing firms where maybe they're just passive or they're not even looking at all, but they're getting calls from staffing firms to come and potentially uh, post for a position at Northern Trust. Um, you know, what we're seeing is the resources going through the direct sourcing channel are providing talent, the, the, the talent that's coming in I think they're a little bit more willing to invest in our organization. Um, a lot of them are looking for full-time roles. So it, it's in their best interest to potentially, if they're going to start as a contractor to get flipped to a, uh, an employee, they do have a, a vested interest in making the relationship work a little bit differently than some of the, maybe the other staffing firms who are bringing resources in. Um, we also search the pool without having a formal uh, release of a requisition. I think this is another thing that you really don't get access to uh, through a, a, a different channels or different ways you manage your program. We're able to look through that pool of talent prior to requisitions coming out to see if they already meet our needs without actually having go going through this long drawn out process, which again helps us bring in talent faster. They should be, I would say, a little bit warmer um, when, when it comes to interest in your organization versus some of the general uh, recruitment processes that are in the marketplace today. Fantastic. And, and you mentioned sort of earlier that, um, you know, this has significantly reduced your uh, attrition. And I was wondering if, um, you know, you can talk a bit more about, uh, you know, what impact in that regard you've seen and what tools are used to, um, you know, reduce that attrition over time. Sure. So we've seen about a 15% reduction in attrition levels, uh, comparatively speaking, to our general staffing firms. And it, it's hard to determine if that's the only factor, but we believe it's the main factor in trying to uh, determine why we have different levels of attrition. Um, we can tell you during the pandemic, and uh, like most people on this call, you probably have higher levels of attrition with people hopping from job to job. Um, and, and Northern Trust is no different. 
But we can tell you that in our program today, we have 15 to 20% less attrition from those that are uh, coming in through the direct sourcing channel versus our general staffing firms. Uh, and again, I think that's directly um, to the fact that these people are searching out for your brands, as well as the fact that the curator needs to do a really good job of keeping these people warm, understanding and updating the profiles that are within the talent net uh, pool so that we're able to more accurately match them up to the jobs that we have available. I think, Scott, just to jump in on the, sort of the topic of attrition that I think is, is related is, uh, you know, with just the nature of contingent workforce, it's, it's transient by nature. So we often refer to a talent pool as a talent ass as well that you are, you're building over time. And so it's not just the initial engagement or connection point with, with that member of the talent pool for Northern Trust, but it's also being able to, to continually keep in touch with those with those folks over time. Um, if they are to your point in this hot market, sort of jumping from job to job, you still have that historical connection point, any historical engagements uh, that you interacted with in the past, and an ability to reach back out to them rapidly in the future. That's exactly right. And within the within the profiles of each one of these resources in our talent pool, as they change roles and skills and interests, uh, they're able to update the profiles, which again, more accurately gets us to a better match between the roles that we have available and the people within the talent pool. And trying to sort of retain and recycle these skills or, you know, people that have had exposure for, you know, different projects or, or things within your company, did, did you have to do much in terms of balancing that with things like tenure policies or, you know, the, the, those sort of uh, issues? No, we really didn't see, uh, we didn't see much of that, Jason. Um, you know, a lot of our policies and procedures uh, stayed consistent uh, when we rolled this out. We didn't have to change much. We, what we did have to do is uh, do a bunch of selling of what the direct sourcing program is, what it would uh, benefit Northern Trust. Uh, you have to sit down with your C-suite you have to get your business managers involved in understanding the benefits to them. And you really got to roll out, roll it out in the right way. And I think a lot of that, um, it, I'm sure we'll, we can get into a little bit, but um, that's going to make your program the most successful is making sure you're, you're following a process to uh, implement your program. Well, Scott, actually, let's, uh, let's continue that thread a little bit, and I'll I'll just throw three specific questions at you. But in general, walk us through. Um, okay, so you decided to execute a direct sourcing strategy. What next? What did implementation look like? How long did it take? What were some of those initial things you had to do internally and externally to launch the direct sourcing strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. So to be very honest, being in procurement, it was. You know what was driving and motivating us to, to start direct sourcing was cost savings. Uh, today, I would say that the savings are just a byproduct of the overall process at this point. Uh, with a tough market the last couple of years, it's now more about those attrition levels, quality of the candidate, and our ability to convert contractors uh, into employees. And don't get me wrong, there's still an expectation that the talent coming through the door needs to be at a cheaper rate if it's coming through direct sourcing. Um, but that's not the sole focus of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, we're a bank, right? Highly regulated and like most banks, very risk averse. And we kind of have to be, right? So as you, you know, getting your C-suite, your organization on board with something that is different and a new process is challenging. Uh, you need to get everyone involved and onboarded uh, from what you're trying to do whether it's legal, compliance, uh, HR, finance, uh, your business unit leaders, we went out and talked to all of them. And we really had TalentNet on our, our side and they were sitting right next to us in these meetings um, and, and trying to answer the questions, the tough questions that our leadership had around, well, why, would, why, do we, why should we do this? Uh, what's the impact gonna be? Well. What about all these cons that we found out through the process and uh, we've done some research on? Please walk us through 
why we shouldn't be so scared about implementing something like this. So you have to understand what gaps you have and trying to close that with your organization. You have to sell the benefits and I'll, I'll tell everybody on this call and, and Jason, as, you, as you're thinking about this more, don't shy away from explaining the pros and cons and how you manage to get through some of those more difficult conversations. Um, getting executive leadership buy-in is paramount to the success of your program, especially when you get into launching it. And the support and the push from them on trying to utilize the program, I think, is really important. Um, we had multiple connects a week once we started implementation with our curator, with TalentNet, to understand the overall project plan, what actions were open, with whom, um, if there were open questions, what decisions points we needed. And we stopped and discussed those. And we didn't move past that until everyone was comfortable with the next steps and with the decisions we were making. If I had any guidance and some of the things that I think kept me up at night were, don't be afraid to ask the tough questions when you're in implementation. And don't wait until you're implemented to, to ask a question. Take the time to set it up correctly, investigate all your best practices that are offered up by TalentNet and your creator. Uh, and then implement as many as you can uh, at the start. This is gonna help you get started and successful as quickly as possible. And I think one of the things that Northern Trust uh, didn't do on the onset was take every one of those recommended best practices. And what I believe happened is it really slowed us down at the very beginning of our implementation and reaching our initial goals. And that's no fault of, of, of TalentNet or my curator or Northern Trust. It was just a situation of how we rolled it out and how our comfort level and the things we uh, took to heart as far as recommending those best practices. Overall, I think in summary, it took about four months from the, sign we, the time we signed the contract to the time we actually were live. And I think the length of the implementation will be dependent on how big your program is, what DMS you're using, uh, the ability for your company to give dedicated time to that implementation. As I mentioned earlier, you need resources from your MSP, your curator, talent net, your organization, and it can't be just a part of their daily job, right? This needs to be a dedicated implementation if you want to do it right and get it done quickly. Yeah, that's a really good point. And actually, one thing you also mentioned there that should be noted and is true is direct sourcing as a concept will often look different, will often have nuances in each company that utilizes it. Um, and that actually kind of just brings me to a quick follow on to implementation and that is change management. How much change needed to happen in your existing processes, in your existing team, in, in the way the MSP function, things like that. How much, how much was your effort to build the business case and implement about that internal stakeholder management versus reconfiguring the way processes worked internally? Yeah, good question. I would, I would say that from a process perspective, there was not much change, right? Um, but it, it will depend on how each one of uh, the people on this call, if, you, if you're interested in moving forward, how you make your process, right? Our process was we were going to add talent net at the very beginning of our process, seeing requisitions 24 to 48 hours in advance of our staffing firms. In order to do that, TalentNet and, and Beeline work together to integrate so that that process could be seen. And that's really an MSP function for us at Northern. Um, from a manager perspective, not a lot of change, but it's about communication. We had to explain to them what direct sourcing is. And you know, sending out an email blast isn't isn't impactful enough to get them to understand. So it's vital that your MSP and your curator really explain as requisitions are needed, why they're seeing certain things in the tool. Why am I seeing a resource that's $30 cheaper than everybody else? Well, th that must be a really, you know, part of my French crappy resource, right? They can't be meeting the needs of, of my requisition. So I'm just gonna go ahead and disqualify that. Not the case, right? You got to explain to them what they're seeing, why they're seeing it, and that the dress sourcing channel is another avenue we're pursuing, and it will be at a lower price point than your general staffing firms. So a lot of where 
we had to push was not around ex new processes or program changes, but more around the communication and how we sell the program to our stakeholders. Having gone through that sort of uh, process and you've kind of, um, you know, sold that into your hiring managers and now you've had the program life for, I think you said three years, what, what kind of uh, feedback do you get from your hiring community and, you know, what, what have they noticed about the change? Yeah, I mean, they're fickle, right? Um, they want things quickly. They don't want to have to get engaged as much as possible. They don't like new processes. I would imagine that's the same for most organizations. Uh, a, a lot of the early feedback was, hey, I just don't understand why we need this supplier. I don't understand why we're bringing in a new supplier, which made us think that they just don't understand that this isn't a supplier. It's a way of finding new talent, right? So we don't like to look at it as a supplier versus we like to look at it as, as a, it's a, an avenue for searching for new talent. So we, those were most of the, the concerns we had early on. Um, and then so just the, the costing, right? So when they saw the overall rates in the tool, uh, their, their, was, their concerns were really around, well, this must not be a, a quality candidate. And I think once we sat down with them, explained them the process, you know, over time, as managers talk to colleagues of theirs and they understand a little bit more about it, as our curator understood more about our culture, more about our, the way our organization works, they're able to enhance their, um, their understanding of our organization and the curation of the talent within the pool. Yeah, an interesting microcosm, uh, sorry, Justin, that's an interesting microcosm of a behavioral economics that they've anchored quality to cost when when you're trying to drive better behavior. It's interesting. Sorry, Justin, I cut across you, please. Yeah, no worries. I was just going to jump in and say, Jason, you know, at least from our perspective, one of the objectives during implementation of direct sourcing is there should really be minimal, if any change at all, to the hiring manager's experience. If you think of them as the end customer, at the end of the day, they're still creating their requisitions in the VMS. They're still evaluating candidates in the VMS. Most of the change is really happening in the, in the background. I, I think that change is important and, and, and it needs to happen. But for your end customer who's your manager, it should not be invasive in their day-to-day -day as well. Um, you know, from our perspective, there's generally three uh, primary work streams of change. There's you know, your internal sort of buy-in and subscription, as Scott mentioned, so your compliance, your HR department, possibly a legal review. Um, there's your operational sort of change management. So is this going to be an extension of your MSP's current responsibilities? Or are you going to have a separate curator that somehow is interfacing uh, with that MSP? And then finally, the implementation and integration of the direct sourcing platform to your VMS. But all of that that's happening during implementation, that change and effect on process shouldn't in any way impact the end hiring managers that are, that are benefiting from that, uh, from that new sourcing channel. So I guess, um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it, you know, it's essentially, it feels like the same process to them. Um, I was wondering from a sort of contractor perspective, you know, that candidate journey, which is, you know, also really key, you know, as you're looking for niche talent, they're the ones that you're fighting for, you know, has, has that changed the same or does that feel different, you know, to, to them? Uh, just to make sure I understand the question from, from finding niche roles, are you saying? Well, just in, in terms of the overall candidate experience, you know, I think, you know, in, in our program, so we're very much sort of somewhere between MSP one and two in that kind of maturity kind of, uh, you know, spectrum. Uh, it probably feels a little bit transactional, you know, our, our contractors come in, uh, you know, they kind of complete their project work and then they're sort of exited and, um, you know, it probably feels a little bit transactional, but just wondering in terms of obviously now you've got these additional tools there's that kind of uh, focus on re retention um you know is you know is there a sort of tangible difference in the way that they you know experience working in your you know applying for roles and seeing roles in your company yeah i i would probably say i don't want to make this controversial but i i would say that we have very good suppliers that work for northern trust um and and our curator in the talent pool uh, I think the onboarding experience, the way that the suppliers work with each one of these resources to bring them in, the onboarding, 
um, th they're getting a very good experience regardless. And I think a lot of the onboarding is really on the managers. Um, so each in, in manager has the rules of the road and what they're supposed to do to, when they're bringing people in. And um, they may or may not follow that. And so you may have a different experience depending on what manager you, uh, brings you in. But from a candidate experience perspective, whether it's a tool uh, or whether it's working through our MSP, our suppliers, or uh, through our direct sourcing program, now, Northern expects that every one of our partners and relationships uh, takes our program to be the number one thing that they're working on, right? And we do scorecards with both our curator and with our uh, staffing firms. And we expect them to continue to work with us and bring to light issues they're having when bringing people on board. So I think we have a very similar experience and I think that's kind of what we're shooting for. Scott, continue that thread a little bit, that thought process, but, but actually take us back to the beginning. What was the engagement with your supplier community when you made this decision? How did you communicate it to them? What was their initial reaction? And then carry us forward to today. What, if any, change in relationship have you seen with your supplier community? Sure. Uh, you know, this is really important to Northern Trust. Um, you know, we didn't just implement a direct sourcing program and say, I hope you all enjoy it uh, and not explain what was going on and what the impact was going to be. So our, our supplier base, just like that, we want them to treat us with that, that respect and an overall relationship that we would want from a partner, we spent a lot of time on the overall strategy and how we were gonna implement and how would this would impact our current suppliers. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we do scorecards every quarter. Uh, I would say three to four quarters prior to rolling this out, we let our supplier base know that uh, we are gonna start evaluating our program and overall number of suppliers and most likely will be eliminating somewhere between one and two suppliers over the course of the year. Uh, we didn't share too much into the why, but our suppliers know that they're always, they always need to be on top of their game and those scorecards are important and they drive where we're going next with, uh, with our supply base. And so we knew that we were going to add in direct sourcing eventually. And we have quarterly supplier summits. Obviously now with the pandemic, we haven't had them in a couple of years. We have them virtually, but we had an uh, in-person supplier summit where uh, we talked about the rollout of direct sourcing, why we were doing it. And obviously our suppliers then started to understand why we were gonna potentially eliminate one to two suppliers, right? We wanted our suppliers to still work as hard as they normally would trying to recruit for our organization but why would they do that if they were losing revenue to a direct sourcing channel, right? So by eliminating one to two suppliers, we're able to continue to have, a, hopefully as they earn it, a revenue stream for the suppliers while also growing our direct sourcing in the way we wanted to. Uh, and then we announced finally to the suppliers what we were doing, how it worked. Uh, there were a lot of questions. I think just like uh, if some of you are, are new to direct sourcing, trying to understand what it is, we had a lot of suppliers that asked questions around, hey, tell us a little bit more about this. And then we had others that kind of knew what it was and asked more direct questions on how it impacts them. But I think the rollout went well. I think that because we communicated to them upfront and shared with them our journey and what we were doing, uh, we haven't seen too much negative impact overall to our program, if, if at all. Yeah, good. Quick. Uh, again, sort of one more step on that thought and a um, question here that actually came in from the audience. So when you think about how you're using direct sourcing as just an additional avenue, um, still leveraging your supply base, have you made conscious choices about routing uh, certain recs towards direct sourcing first and, and carving off other I'm thinking here now like skill sets, like are there certain skill sets you leave for the supplier community versus others that route towards direct sourcing? Have you made a distinction there or is it 100% everywhere? And again, they're just, the direct sourcing channel is just an additional route. Yeah, we, we talk about this all the time, right? Um, I think you need to be able to have flexibility in your program. And so just because last week we decided to do X doesn't mean next week we're gonna do Y, right? 
I would say we release everything to everybody, right? And, and especially now with talent being so scarce, um, it, it makes sense not to limit uh, a certain way or another. When we have bundled solutions that we need for staffing, you know, say we need 10 to 15 people and we need more of a comprehensive look, view and oversight from say one supplier, we wouldn't release that necessarily to our direct sourcing channel. We would do that and, and call uh, some of our consulting companies and our staffing firms to uh, put our scope out, our requirements, expectations, and see what kind of combined uh, negotiation we can put together. So that typically wouldn't go through our direct sourcing channel. Um, even our niche roles, uh, you know, we we have, I'll say 80 to 90 percent of our roles are pretty common across uh, probably everybody on this call, and then we have some niche roles that we consider harder to find in the marketplace. Uh, we do release those through our direct sourcing channel. And I think it all depends on uh, what regions you're, you're trying to uh, source from, but we tend to struggle a little bit with niche roles in general, whether it's through a staffing firm or through direct sourcing, but, but there's so few of these I would say these these niche roles that are coming through our program, I think the direct sourcing channel today for us is a little bit more difficult to find the talent because the, the sourcing pool that's built up just isn't there for that niche talent today. So we tend to have to go to staffing firms and or niche firms to try to find some of that talent. Great. Hey, uh, Justin, uh, well, look, we did invite Scott in because of his expertise, but I'm going to let him give his voice a break for a second. Justin, there's two questions that have come in from the audience. I'm going to bundle them and I'm going to ask you to get us started on this. Uh, and, and Scott, please chime in um, after Justin spoke. But um, the questions are about um, the evolution of direct sourcing. So, uh, and look, Scott's on a three-year journey. Um, Justin, from your perspective, how has the industry changed in those three years? Uh, and I say, I shouldn't say industry, how has the solution of direct sourcing evolved over three years? And then the second piece of this is from a uh, geo perspective. Um, Scott, you kicked us off. I mean, for you, this is a US-based solution. Justin, what are you seeing in terms of this type of model um, outside the US or, or expanding into other regions? Yeah, sure. And I, I think it's changing in, in a number of ways, um, You know, both from a, a a technology perspective, a, a general strategy perspective, and, and then an operational perspective. So, you know, from a technology perspective, certainly in our experience, when we first started, typically the most, the, the deepest subscription that we would have is, is more around redeployment of, of a known workforce. So a full payroll workforce, um, you know, former contingent workers that you had sourced in the past. That then started to expand out into sort of brand attracted, Again, having something on your career site, job boards, LinkedIn, et cetera, and really advertising your brand out into the market and trying to attract net new talent and sort of combine those channels of, of net new talent that your brand attracting with talent that you're, that you're redeploying. Along with that, though, you know, I think from a, a strategy point of view, that really started to, to, to uh, develop sort of a bridge between commonly between the you know, procurement and finance departments that we often see only a contingent program and talent acquisition and HR departments. There's always been this sort of desire for this you know, concept of total talent and you know, a job is a job and talent is talent. But I think because of a lot of sort of siloed technologies and si siloed business processes, it was really hard to make that a reality. So as we're starting to see some of those processes being adopted in the contingent space to brand attract talent, and you have systems that are then you know, building these talent pool, pools and holding these databases of people, there's a more practical way to actually sort of draw a bridge between those two worlds of full-time talent acquisition and contingent. So we're, we're sort of seeing those domains now come together and become a reality. And then I think operationally, um, obviously the, the MSP world is, is quite evolved and mature now, but with the introduction of direct sourcing, we're really seeing MSPs sort of ex extend and expand their typical scope of services and, and really get into this more of this sort of strategic, um, almost you know, talent attraction slash as we refer to curation type role that they're playing as well, in addition 
to what's been their traditional MSP services in the past. So I, I think there's a lot of change happening. I think it's exciting. I think there's still a long way to go. It's certainly still a maturing market. Um, but I think if you look at it from different facets, um, there's a lot of evolution there over the last, you know, I would say seven to 10 years. Great. And you actually, there was, um, this is very meta guys. We, uh, we had a question come in from the head of TA for Zoom on a Zoom webinar, which is, which is really cool. And, and Justin, you kind of actually answered his question there. The, the melding together of direct sourcing for a contingent workforce and TA for perm workforce, the, the melding together of strategy and tools and processes because talent is talent. Scott, would you add anything uh, to what Justin said about the evolution? I couldn't have said any better. I couldn't have said any better. I'll just leave it alone with what just Justin said. <laughs> Great. So then um, I, I just mentioned talent is talent. Let's get back to that because I do think this is one of the key components of a direct sourcing strategy. It, it's about the talent. Um, but I'm going to spin us to a compliance perspective. So Scott, as you were going through this in decision making, what guidance or what objections did you have to overcome with legal and or compliance departments in your organization as it relates to co-employment? Did you face that challenge and, and how did you how did you navigate? Yeah, so back to the, one of the first points I made, being, being a bank and highly regulated, very risk averse, right? So this is a lot of the angst that kept our organization up at night, right? Um, some of it around, uh, I think one of the questions in the chat talked about uh, your brand and logo, you know, where's our logo going to be and what's it, what is it the right color scheme and how is it going to be used? Are we going to confuse our community of people looking at Northern? Are they going to go, is this a full-time role or is this a part-time role? Is it going through one program or another? So a lot of the questions were all answered. You know, we had Justin come in and a couple of his team to talk through with each functional group all their questions. Um, some of it was around, um, well, I don't really want our roles to be confused with full-time roles on Google or in Indeed. And what we would sometimes say is, well, look, we're not using our brand the right way. If you actually go on the internet today, right now, and we did a little um, kind of an example, I guarantee you, you could find our name out there and our brand and our logo that other people are using on our behalf and we're not. And they're like, I don't believe that. So we went online and we showed them that we have people out there recruiting, sub vendors, vendors, using our name, using our brand already to attract the talent. So that was a perfect segue to say, look, why are we not using our own brand to do the same thing? And we can control the narrative, we control the messaging, we control the job descriptions. And at the same time, we are hopefully doing this at a cheaper price point. And I think they got through a lot of that, right? Obviously there's contracting. We all know that contracting goes back and forth and you eventually get to a place where everyone feels comfortable, right? But we did enough of a journey with TalentNet to understand the capability of the actual tool. Uh, we did enough investigation of the curator to understand uh, what their role would be. Again, very similar to a payroll and an MSP, just the expectation of us was they were gonna do a deeper dive on these resources and really get to know, understand and keep them warm for when we did have things coming up or if we did, right? Hey, this is a really good candidate, hard to find niche skill, Hey, Scott, you guys need to look at this person. Do you have anything coming up? You Maybe let's go talk to some managers to see if this is something that makes sense. So as we started to answer these questions, it became pretty easy to have our organization say, I'm not comfortable, Scott. Go ahead and implement, and let's see where it goes. So aside from the brand question, um, you know, the, when, when I've talked internally and, you know, like yourself, um, you know, I'm a farmer, so, you know, we're, we're quite sort of risk averse as well um you know and heavily regulated the the concern has been less about sort of using the brand i think you know we've kind of gone through 
variations of that conversation that has become more one of uh, employment risk and sort of you know we talked a bit about you know melding together the the permanent and the contract sides of recruitment and the, you know there's great you know possibilities for alignment there but I think in, internally the conversations I've had so far there's a within sort of corners of the business and those ones you know legal ethics you know that sort of thing that real worry about you know do we create some additional problems in in doing that and I was just wondering if that was anything that you'd have to sort of face into as you've gone through either you know the implementation or you know the involvement of your program. Yeah so our talent acquisition is run in HR and then procurement runs our labor program. So we already have a slight separation in our way of thinking, although we want to get to a place where we're doing total workforce management, right? Um, slow journey, we're, you know, we're, we're moving at a glacial pace, but we're, we're trying to get there. Um, you know, the, all the concerns were kind of laid out at the beginning. We're, like we don't, want to add our all our roles in the same spot so in our landing page we have a very clear distinction between full-time roles and then where our uh, talent community is right um for for a good reason because there was that comfort there wasn't that comfort level that it wouldn't get all messed up together and we wouldn't understand what we're doing who we recruit you know are we recruiting for full-time here is this a part-time role i'm not really sure um, so we did have a lot of those discussions up front, but still today we do separate the two conversations between uh, talent acquisition roles and our roles going through our direct sourcing program. Maybe just to jump in on this for a second, because this topic has come up for years and comes up frequently, the idea of co-employment and, and direct sourcing, and I'll just include two caveats. So one, this is not legal advice, and, and number two, that you know, there's the, the sort of regulatory and legal framework that you're working in from country to country changes drastically. I mean, when we're dealing with, say, France versus the U.S. versus Canada, very, very different laws. But speaking more specifically from the U.S. market, uh, this comes up so much. We actually, a few years ago, we commissioned Michael Best Law Firm to develop a white paper on this and, and around this. And their conclusion tends to be the most common conclusion that we see during implementation in the market. And that's that the majority of, 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 of case law and, and legal precedent for co-employment, at least within the US market, happens around control. And once there's a bum in seat, so to speak, in other words, once there is actually a, a potential employment relation that's existing, uh, and that in the sourcing and attraction process, where really direct sourcing is coming in, there's not that much case law or legal precedent uh, that sh that's really increasing your risk beyond what it would be uh, just with the level of control that typically takes place anyways in a contractor, uh, you know, corporate uh, sort of relationship. Again, a lot different in Europe, uh, in the UK, um, in, in Canada, but from the US, that's the most common outcome that we found. Justin, I'm going to put you on the spot because the question just came in. Uh, and again, to be clear, not legal advice, but have you had any experience with direct sourcing in the, in the Netherlands and, and any unique challenges with labor laws in the Netherlands to a direct sourcing solution? Yeah, I'm not sure that I could speak to the nuance specifically in the Netherlands. We've certainly dealt quite a bit uh, in EMEA as a, as a whole. So for example, um, France is, is definitely one of the most strict uh, sort of uh, labor um, regimes that we've dealt with sort of around this that, um, you know, we've definitely, you know, through legal assistance and uh, through sort of obviously our, our customers uh, having their own legal sort of counsel, um, been able to come up with creative solutions. Um, I can't, I wish I could, but I can't speak specifically to the Netherlands. Cool. Thank you. Um, Scott. One of the, you mentioned uh, when you when you went live the way in which the direct sourcing solution integrated with the MSP. Can you talk about how you leveraged your MSP in the change management process and in the um, stakeholder management process and even in the technology? Um, just the, the fact that Beeline was an existing tool already used by the MSP. Um, what did that look like at the time of implementation? Sure. So obviously, it, this is an education for everybody, right? both from a stakeholder perspective, from an ownership perspective, a leadership perspective in our MSP. Direct sourcing was a new concept and a new understanding of what it means. So 
we brought them our MSP, which Jay, you would know is Pontoon Solutions, right? We self-serving question. Of course. We brought them along for the journey, right? Once we decided to implement, they were part of our meetings. They were part of the discussions. They saw angles potentially with the integration that we didn't see, right? Because they're in the tool every day. They're the experts from an admin perspective. They're the ones seeing how requisitions get released, how, how things flow. And they were able to see different aspects that potentially uh, my team wasn't able to see or our HR, or legal, or our technical team. So bringing them along was important. And then while we were doing that, we started to have the MSP build out training and scripts and how our communication was going to be. And, uh, you know, TalentNet was very good about giving us standardized communications or templates of different timing within the implementation and when we need to communicate to our stakeholders and who, which stakeholders we needed to communicate when. And I think that really helped us along our journey. But then it's just, it's just getting in there and understanding and, and working within the tool once we went live our MSV was able to then have those more fruitful conversations with our, our managers. And really that's where the, the, the proof was in the pudding, right? Getting and sitting with them, walking them through the changes. As Justin mentioned, user interface didn't, it doesn't really change for the manager. The experience doesn't really change, but the concept and the understanding of what we're trying to do as an organization needs to be brought to them. And, you know, that MSP link between my managers and the organization is key for getting them on board. If they did a really terrible job of not selling this program, we wouldn't have saw anybody go through this channel. No one would have understood it. No one would have supported it. And then we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today. You probably have someone else on this panel. Glad it's you. Uh, we've actually, um, there's, uh, a question came in and I would like everybody to respond to this. Jason, from your perspective, um, please respond in terms of what you hope to get or what you expect to get from maybe a direct sourcing solution. But question is, is direct sourcing a silver bullet? Does it solve every challenge? Um, and does it remove the, um, you know, the need for a vendor neutral for a supplier community. Scott, you've already alluded to that, but, but is it a silver bullet? Is it solving all the, you know, talent problems that you have? Yeah, so you asked me to, to respond. I think the, um, the key things as we were thinking about them or, or have been thinking about them, for me, I'd say um, agility is, is one. I think, you know, it's certainly something where we're seeing one of our real sort of challenges when we look at ourselves against competitors is our agility to market, our agility to get to candidates and agility to sort of onboard them. It, you know, so moving quicker in, in that space and being better engaged with the with our with our candidates is, is probably the key driver. I think the other part is, um, and this has been mentioned earlier, is that sort of um, more direct control over the messaging and how we actually get our message across to candidates. So you know, not having an interface between us and the people that we're trying to reach. Um, I guess, um, and I think Tim McKegg from uh, my, my company is on the call and he's in procurement. So I, I better say cost would be at least a driver in there somewhere as well. Um, but yeah, I think those probably the, the three sort of key areas. And if I think sort of more strategically, I guess it's kind of about bringing together um, and gaining uh, efficiencies really from bringing together more closer uh, permanent and, and contract kind of processes and the way that we kind of work, um, you know, perhaps as a sort of stepping stone, again, glacially, uh, as Scott referenced towards uh, total talent. Scott, what do you think? Has it, yeah, has it, yeah. Been a, has it been a silver bullet for all talent problems for you? You know, I'll, I'll speak generally and say, I think it depends on every organization, where they're at in their journey of implementing a program, not just direct sourcing, but just in general. Like, are you just trying to understand your data? Where are you at in your journey? And I would say for Northern Trust, um, you know, I liken this to a, a puzzle, right? You could have a, a big puzzle with lots of pieces and you get done with the puzzle and you realize you're missing a piece. You're looking on the floor, you're, what is it? For us, 
we had a lot of different pieces and we were missing that one small piece. And then we popped it in and that's what we have direct sourcing. Now you fast forward down the road, one of my kids may come in and knock some pieces off the table, right? Pandemic could be one of those, right? Now, maybe there's another thing that we have to find. Maybe there's another piece we have to put in there. And so you have to always look and evolve your program um, you're not always going to be ahead of the curve, but trying to stay at least understanding of the new things that are going on. I wouldn't call Northern Trust a trailblazer in the fact that we did direct sourcing. I would say we were earlier adopter in the process. We did a bunch of due diligence and it was scary for us. It really was. It was something that, you know, a handful of people were doing at the time and, um, you know, not everybody was doing it. So it scared us a little bit, but you got to jump in. There's this process, I think, can only help and not hurt a program. So I know that's you know my little toot for everybody here, but I, I think it's something where there's no silver bullet, but this will be helpful for a lot of you people looking for a way to enhance your program to that next level. Can't wait to see what it is we're talking about together in 2027. I agree, Scott. It's a, it's, it is an evolution. Justin, I'd love your take on that same question, though, as well. Yeah, so I think um, simple answer is no, it's absolutely not a silver bullet. Um, I think often there's sort of a suggestion or feeling in the market that, um, you know, direct sourcing and, you know, traditional fulfillment through traditional staffing suppliers can't coexist. Um, we believe that they can, we believe that they, that they, that they should, um, and that ultimately that these are, these are complementary sourcing channels that exist. But I think if you think generally about you know, the concept of what direct sourcing is attempting to do, you have to take it outside of contingent labor or even talent acquisition in general. And just think about the trends in the world around technology, self-service and, and experience, whether you're a customer, whether you're a candidate. When I want to order a car now, I pick up an app and I order it. When I want to you know, buy a plane ticket, I go online to the airline of my choice and I can do that at my own choosing, you know, when I want, where I want. So I do think it's important that organizations look as they evolve their talent acquisition strategies, whether it's contingent in the full-time space, wherever it is, um, that you do have to be sort of on trend and modernizing your, your, your process and providing that self-serve sort of direct avenue uh, for, for talent to sort of come through. Um, I don't think it's going to replace traditional suppliers. I think ultimately we're going to see a higher level of adoption for it, but it's going to be complementary to traditional supply base. Thanks, guys. Um, Jason, I, I would like to get an interesting perspective from you here for our audience of, um, look, we've, we have thrown a ton of questions out, um, many of which I'm sure, Jason, you've already considered yourself, already thought through, already worked through. Um, but, but what other questions have you asked yourself or have you asked your organization um, that maybe we haven't thrown at Scott yet today? that would be good for our audience who is considering a, a similar strategy? What's, what's another one or two questions or the key question you answered for yourself that you would advise them? So I, th I think, um, you know, the, the question is always one, I think that, um, you know, I have to consider when we're sort of looking at new implementations or new solutions is one of business readiness. Um, you know, we've gone through, um, uh, a pretty accelerated sort of uh, going from 40 countries doing something very different. So we were completely greenfield only two years ago to having, you know, an outsourced recruitment solution across everything. Um, and I think um, probably or partly because of that experience, I think you sort of go through implementation and you, you have the scars to prove that you've been through them, don't you? That uh, I think one of my learns from going through that experience the first time around was um, sort of being, uh, you know, making sure I was better prepared from a, a business readiness perspective. So it was certainly felt, you know, as we went through our launches that, you know, this was an uphill struggle. I think, you know, talking to Scott, it didn't really seem that that was such a difficult sell in terms of change management, but I'm just wondering from a business readiness perspective, you know, if there was anything that you, you know, had to take into account really to make sure that this was gonna land successfully, you know, in, in addition to what you've, you've kind of said already. You know, again, I, I think the overall impact to your stakeholders is so minimal. Um, their readiness, they should be ready, right? It's just another avenue to get talent. I think the expectations at the beginning when you're selling 
what you're trying to do to your stakeholders and your leadership, uh, you got to make sure your business case, uh, you're going to be held accountable to that business case uh, is really what I'm trying to get at. So if you come in there and say, I plan on doing 5% uh, uptick in the first year through direct sourcing, and then the second year it needs going to go to 15 to 25. And then after that, we're going to be at 50%. You got to make sure you're working hand in hand with everybody who's involved in this process, from the curator to your payroll service, if that's different, to TalentNet to understand and monitor along the way. Because you may not know right away where the gaps are, but you got to find them quickly. Otherwise, you're not going to hit those goals that you have put in place or that the organization is going to hold you accountable to because they were the ones that supported it, right? Um, there's there's things in contingent labor and in staffing that are just are not going to work, right? This is one that is proven it works, but now there's different things. Your organization can get in the way, your people can get in the way, the curator can get in the way. There's different things that could slow you down to where you want to go, and you just got to be cognizant of what those are and how to get through them. So when you get done three years down the road and you look and kind of assess what you did and you didn't come close to where you thought you were going to be, you got to understand why, and you got to put all effort into trying to make sure that you can get better. And you mentioned earlier on, it, it sort of struck me that you were, you were saying that you, you had various benefits you were looking for that, you know, were on your sort of checklist that you wanted to tick off, and they, they didn't all sort of land at the, the same time. So I was just wondering, you know, what order or, you know, in what timescales you kind of started to receive those benefits after implementation, and, you know, what order they arrived in? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll again. I'm very transparent. I'll, I'll tell you one of the slip ups that we had. Uh, one of the recommended best practices is to post your roles that are going through your talent pool on some of the services like Google and Indeed um, to again promote the roles. And there was some hesitation on Northern side to do that because again some of the HR and legal uh, questions that we had outstanding. So when we put our business case together and we're showing uptick in utilization and usage of this program coupled with savings, that was all assuming that we didn't have a concern around those services and how much they would help. And so as we started to move, we realized, wow, we're not really getting where we want as quick as we thought we would. What are the things holding us back? And then we would step back and say, okay, remember, here are the things that we would recommend that would probably get you where you're doing, but Northern has to be comfortable with it and you guys got to move forward with it. Otherwise, you're going to kind of go a little bit slower than you thought, right? So building that talent pool is key to your success, right? If you have 15 people in the talent pool and you have 150 rolls out, you're not going to you're not going to have too many fills, right? So you really need to build that talent pool and getting people attracted to your brand is important. The placement of that link on your career site is important. That how good your curator is about once the talent's there is keeping them there and keeping them warm and keeping them interested and in updating things. And all of it plays a hand in making sure you're going to get to where that business case is and the return on investment is. And I, I think, again, to my point, we implemented most, but not all. That hurt our overall ability to bring people in. Thus, our savings was less. We haven't had any risks, right? We, we didn't take all the risks we should have. Therefore, we've been able to manage the risks that we did take on. And I would tell anybody here, you got to push the envelope on your organizations to make this the most successful that you can. Good advice there. Uh, Justin, I'm going to just offer it up to you. Any, any final uh, thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up here at the top of the hour? You know, I, I think I would just echo um, Scott's sentiment that often, um, you know, and less and less now, but when we get involved in, in, in new engagements, there's this feeling of sort of hit the switch, turn it on, and, you know, not to make something sound overly complex or time consuming, but I, I think there is a massive ROI to be had if you really think this through ahead of the implementation. If you're thinking through how to deal with your internal stakeholders and gain buy-in, if you're thinking through sort of the current role of your MSP and how that's going to change, you know, if you're thinking through how the integration is going to work between your VMS and your direct sourcing platform, and you map that all out. It's not that much work. I mean, you can you can go through this within you know a month, a couple months, but 
it's really important that you get that all button down before you're trying to go live. Or I think to some of Scott's points, you're, you're really going to be trying to sort of backpedal and, and go and fix these things later on. Great. Okay, well, guys, uh, we are at the top of the hour. To our audience, we tried to get to uh, the questions we saw coming in via the chat. Hopefully, we hit most, if not all of those. Thank you for uh, the two-way participation on this. It's great to see that you were engaged and listening. Scott, Jason, Justin, thank you, gents. It's been fun doing this with you. I appreciate your time. Certainly appreciate the expertise. Scott, I feel like uh, you could have kept going for another hour, so maybe there's a version two down the road. Uh, you didn't seem to be slowing up at all. Uh, but to those that joined, to our audience, thanks for joining. Have a great day. Gents, we'll speak with you all soon. Take care and happy Talk new year. Soon, guys. Take care. Okay. Be safe. Oh.